This is Colossians 3, thinking about setting our minds on the things that are above, coming into 2024. It's Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. And then a little further down. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you, richly teaching and admonishing one another in a wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray. And so Father, uh, as we're thinking about the end of this year, <clears throat> tomorrow's, again, it's just another day, but it's also a new year. And so we thank you for your faithfulness uh, during 2023. You, you are a wonderful, amazing God. Your love to us doesn't end. We, in fact, we know it more and more as we come to know you more and more and know of your character and your goodness, see your work in our lives and in the world. And Father, I'm thinking of uh, some of the things that are happening in our world or have happened in this year uh, in our own country, things that are happening even now in other parts of this country with uh, storms and floods and fires and all kinds of disaster. Thinking about people who are uh, particularly lonely around this time of year, people who are out of work and have uh, no, no leads or no hope for work in the future, in the near future. Thinking about people overseas who are suffering at the hands of uh, people who are doing evil things or even countries upon country, people upon people tribes against tribes. Father, help us as we're thinking about the next year. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Lord, help us to be those light bearers, light bringers into a dark world that so desperately needs to know your love, so desperately needs your presence, so desperately needs the salvation that is only found in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his coming for us. We just celebrated that all week. What a wonderful thing. Again, you're such a wonderful God. You become like us in Christ. Thank you for not leaving us, abandoning us, but coming for us and saving us. And so help us, Father, to uh, be both hearers of your word right now and also doers in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Uh, so at the beginning of this, there's a famous passage of Scripture. This is, this is a, uh, and we, we skipped the bit, but we'll come back to it, the bit we skipped in a minute. Very famous part of Scripture. How does it help us to think about the next year? Uh, well, here's, here's the bad news, kind of. Here's the kind of bad news in verse 3. It says, you're dead. That's the bad news. You're dead. And you might think, well, I thought I had more time. Or uh, this can't be it. Fun while it lasted. Uh, but the good news is uh, you're no longer dead but risen with Christ. So the people who, Paul, is, Paul who wrote this letter, um, he's writing to the, this, the, this church and he's saying, if, if then you have been raised with Christ, so he's, he's kind of assuming that the people he's writing to have indeed been raised with Christ. He's saying, if you've been raised with Him, it means you've already died. And if you have already died, it means you've already died to yourself and it means you are now fully alive not to your old self, not to your old way, not to your sinful flesh, not to the rebelliousness, not to try to reach up to God with your best efforts and say, love me because I'm earning your love, but to die to all of that and be alive to Christ, to be alive to holiness, to be alive to righteousness, to be alive to the things and the ways of Jesus. That's what Paul is writing here, saying, here's the bad news, you have died, but the good news is you're alive in Christ. This is the good news. 
And if we're thinking about, <clears throat> again, thinking about old, old year or last year and next year, again, these kinds of things, like I've made lots and lots of New Year's resolutions in my lifetime, heaps of them. And many of them I've been able to, to go and achieve. And many of them have been real, like they've loomed really large in my thinking at the beginning of the year, like January, I'm like, I, I need to do this. It's like a big mountain for me. I'm gonna you know, climb that figurative mountain because I'm not gonna do cardio. And I've climbed that figurative mountain. And then by January five or six, I'm like, oh, I did that. My dreams, my goals way too small. They loomed really large, but then when I actually went to, to go put in some effort, discovered they're actually pretty easy. Conversely, lots of goals over the years that I've gone, this is, I can do this, this is doable, set my will to it. I'm gonna climb that, again, figurative mountain because no cardio, gonna climb that mountain and then within a month go, this is too hard. Or get back into the rhythm of work and kids go back to school and things get busy and discipline wanes, habits haven't been established, <clears throat> goals get forgotten and then roll around to the next year and you're like, oh yeah, I was going to do that last year. I was going to do that. I even this week, I was looking at every year, I make a little list. Don in 2024. Don in 2023. Don in 2022. I looked at my list for Don in 2017. I was like, I've got to get around to that someday. <laughs> got to get around to that someday. Uh, encouragingly, some of them have been done, but many still undone. And so I just kind of <laughs> copy paste Don in 2017, delete seven and, and one and put in a two and a four and let's go again. But as we're thinking about New Year, it's, it, kind of, it might be able to help us to go, okay, this, was, this is gone now. We don't get 2023 back. We don't want to live in the past. I want to go back there. We want to step into the new or the next thing because that's the only thing we can do. And Paul is saying, you have died. You can't go back into death. In other places, he, he uses the imagery of slavery. He said, you were slaves now you're free. Why do you long for slavery again? And he was saying, you, you've died. Death is final apart from Christ. There's no looking back, no thinking back, no wishing, oh, I wish I was dead again. He's saying, no, you're alive now in Jesus. So you are in God, he says, because you are in Christ who is God. So you were dead in your sins in the former ways. Now you're alive in Christ, in God, because you're united with Him. And so you have union with God in Christ. You have life with God in Christ. You are alive. And so Paul's saying, don't walk as the dead walk. He makes this pretty explicit when he writes to the church in Ephesus. <clears throat> he writes this in uh, chapter 5. He says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. He's saying people are going to say, you, you've died. Now you're alive in Christ. But they're going to try to sell you on death again. He says, don't be deceived. Don't become partners with them, he says. For at one time you were darkness. Not you were in darkness, you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. You weren't just clamouring around in the darkness, you were participating in darkness. You were darkness. And he says, now you're not just in the light, you are light because you're in Christ. Jesus says this, he says, you are the light of the world. Go shine your light. Don't live as darkness again. And you know, put a basket over your light, put it on a lampstand and let it shine for all in the house. You are now light. So he says, walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what light does. <clears throat> light shows what's happening in the dark. So it says, live as light. Don't participate in the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them in your light bringing. When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? It's in our 
key verse, verse 2, where Paul writes, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now what he's not saying is, be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly use. He's not saying disregard the things that are happening on earth. He's saying don't care, don't love, don't participate in material things. He's not setting up this kind of dichotomy where he says spiritual things are good, physical things are bad. He's not doing any of that. He's saying the things that come from above. We've got to set our minds on those things. Don't set our minds on the things that come from the earth. How do we do this? We do this by living in light of your death to death. That's how we do it. We need to go into 2014, 2024. Going into 2024. No time travel yet. We'll get to time travel. 2024, uh, we're going in with the mindset of I am dead to death, which is awesome. It means death has no power over, over you anymore. It means we don't live with death looming over us. Death doesn't threaten us. We're not afraid of death. The sting of death is gone. It means we grieve death differently as well. We live in light of our death to death by no longer participating in the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather exposing them, by discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. <clears throat> so not just going, what seems good to me? This is what's in front of me. I'm going to go chase after it. But rather, again, by setting our minds on things that are from above to go to God as our, and we talked about this last week, as our counsellor, not as someone that we go to to get some good advice and then we will discern, well, is that advice from God good or, or not? but rather to go to him as God, as the purely volitional, perfect, holy, majestic, like omnipotent God who does whatever he pleases and does everything in accordance with his character, who breathes and billions and trillions of stars and galaxies come into existence in obedience to his voice, this is the God we go to and say, help me, lead me, guide me. Not with just some advice and then I'll take that under advisement and I'll go do whatever I want to do anyway. Not as a like perfunctory, well, I guess I'll get a pray about it, so I'll just, I'll just speak some words, I'll breathe into the air, but rather to go to the God who can do everything and who loves you and has demonstrated his love for you over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout history and throughout your life. And say, what's best? And by making the best use of your time, that's what he, Paul writes to the Ephesians. How are you measuring how you spend your time? Again, this is like, this is not heaping shame and guilt for 2023. This is laying a foundation for 2024. How are you using your time? What does that look like? How are you making changes based on how you measure how you use your time? What does that look like? Are we making the best use of the time? What that doesn't mean is work 20 hours a week, sleep four hours a week. Oh, sorry, a day. Sleep, work 20 hours a day. Some of you are going, 20 hours a week sounds pretty good. Four hours sleep a week, I'll die. But I'll only have worked 20 hours, so it could be all right. 20 hours a day. <clears throat> That's not what that means. Resting well is a really good use of your time. God has instituted rest into the rhythm of the week, into the rhythm of the seasons. Seasons of feasting, seasons of fasting, seasons of celebrating, seasons of mourning, seasons of repenting. It's not saying just go work and work hard and then drop dead. But how do we make the best use of our time? And he says, and when Christ who is your life appears. So this is the promise in here. 
Not your best life now. Not ease and comfort in your temporary circumstances. But that you're, you're dead to death, you're dead to the flesh, you're alive in Christ, and when He appears, we have an infinite time ahead with Him. And so we have this small period of time here where we can say, no, we can embrace our death to death. <clears throat> and when the darkness comes and says, come back. It's easier here. It's more comfortable here. We can say, I'm, I'm dead to death. I can't participate in the fruitless deeds of darkness anymore. All I, all I can do is bring light and bring them to light. So I want to say Jesus himself is the thing that will satisfy us. Meaning when we aim for lesser satisfactions, it's not that we, we go, as, sometimes as Christians we go, yes, we have Jesus and we say, we sing and we say that he is enough for us, but then with our lives, we actually put on display that he's not enough for us. And we actually go looking for other things to satisfy us. <clears throat> and what we think is Jesus can't satisfy us enough the world is telling us he, we are unsatisfied. We need more satisfaction. Let's go chasing after those other satisfactions. The, those greater satisfactions that will bring us joy, fulfillment. But in reality, it's the exact inverse of that. And those are far too small satisfactions to actually satisfy us. We, we are designed, we are built to be satisfied only in Jesus. And what comes from Him. It's not Jesus and me against the world, it's Jesus and me in the family of Jesus. And not even against the world, it's to shine our light into the world so that the family might grow. And so we're too easily satisfied. It's not that we're too difficult to satisfy and therefore we keep running after things to satisfy us because we're never satisfied. We're too easily satisfied. And we're go to the thing that will ultimately satisfy us. Who is Jesus? You know, um, <clears throat> you know that old, uh, speaking of time travel, time travel trope, you know, if you go back in time, don't step on a bug because that might change, you know, one small change changes lots of things. Uh, you see like a Terminator movie, you've got to go back and get Sarah Connor so that she doesn't have a baby boy who will ruin the apocalypse or whatever. Don't, if you go back in time, don't step on a bug because even if you go back, say 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you might go, but there are so many things I'd like to go back and change. So many things, so many bugs I like to go back and squish. Because even small things, again, will have, could have massive changes over time. And then hopefully I'll come back to today, you know, in a different timeline, and then all my problems have gone. Or I wish I hadn't done that thing, said that thing. I wish I'd be more disciplined. Wish I'd made better friends. Wish I hadn't chased comfort, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I find fascinating about the time travel, like conundrum of going back, squishing on a bug, come back and life's changed, is that you can, in a sense, do that right now with your future self. Where if you just think, if you expand your time horizon, <clears throat> instead of just thinking about satisfaction today, what can I do that will get me to my thing today? Having a short-term thinking, start to zoom out. When we first planted this church, we, apart from me, a bunch of kids, essentially, and we thought, how, what are the, the things that we do today, the people who are making disciples, who, who are making disciples of today, who are the people they are going to be discipling? Who are the people they are going to be discipling? What are their grandkids, grandkids, grandkids? going to be doing and thinking and how are the things that we do today going to be impacting 150, 250 years from now? And then we can plot back and go, we're not trying to like, we don't need to have all the pressure of achieving all of our goals now. Our time frame is not next week, next month, next year, or even necessarily next decade, although you could, you could achieve a lot in the next 10 years, especially if you start squishing the bugs today. But if you start thinking, oh, I'm going to live forever 
And if the Lord tarries, if he waits, if he doesn't come back in my lifetime, like almost every single generation has thought, Jesus has come back in my lifetime, therefore I'm out of time, therefore why build things for the future? Not everybody, but, but many. If we jettison that view and instead go, what are the things that we're building today, this year, next year, 2024? But we're not just building them for 2024, we're actually laying a foundation for my future, for your future, for your righteousness, for your holiness, for your Christ-likeness, and for your spouse or your kids or your family, or if you don't have those things yet, for them when they come, or if you do have them, for your kids' kids or for your neighbours or for your neighbours' kids. What about your neighbours' great-grandkids? What are some of those, again, figurative bugs you could step on today that's going to have this monumental impact on the future? And so my, my thinking is, let's zoom out even just a little bit as we're thinking about 2024. Don't hang all the pressure on 2024. But let's think, okay, 2024 is a year of gospel renewal for us. Individually, as families, as a church, as a city, laying a foundation for what's to come long after we're all gone. And we can think like this because we are dead to death. We're not worried about death. Death is not the great interrupter for us. Death is not the ter terminus. You know, we call it like a terminal illness because it leads to the terminus, death. That's not true for us. It's not a terminus. And so we can plan for long after our death because... We're in Christ. And so don't worry about going back in time, trying to change things you cannot change. Think about the future. You're, you're time traveling now. Let's, you know, have that, have that mindset. We're time traveling right now. We are back from the future. What are those things we're going to do today? How can we do these things? No longer participating in the fruit of the darkness. Discerning what is pleasing to the Lord making the best use of our time. How do we do these things now? What's the first step in living like this? Again, what's the undergirding mindset? Is live in light of your death, live in light of your risenness, and live in light of your going to appear with Christ in glory when He comes. If we maintain this gospel mindset, the many of the things that we fear about the future kind of pale into comparison. We, when we seek the things that are from above, and again, and again as, we, as we actually walk in those things, they can look very mundane. I'm not trying to like, I'm not saying you should like go right, you know, floating around kind of super spiritual and you know, that you don't go to the footy anymore or you, know, you don't have a barbecue anymore or those kinds of things. No, no, all these things translate into the very mundane or like the minutiae of life. But the foundation is you are dead to death. You're alive in Christ. And we live in Him, we live for Him. And the, God's will for us is that we become like Him. And the, the degree of our luminescence, our, our light bringingness, is the, is the degree to which we are like Christ. And so, again, this year, coming, starting tomorrow, I mean, it's, you know, it's, God's been at work for a very long time, but in our, in our thinking, starting tomorrow, it's a year of gospel renewal for us as a foundation for centuries of fruitfulness. If you think, but I, I'm only one little person, when you're thinking about centuries, I don't know if you've looked at your family tree, but you go back five or six generations. I went to a family reunion uh, where one side of my family, if you go back, they came out to South Australia on a boat in 1838. And one couple, the Dawkins family, came out <clears throat> and uh, were in a room about half the size of this room. And their family tree from just 1838 to now filled like the whole wall going around in just a couple hundred years, less than. So if you're thinking about your spiritual children, your discipleship potential, 
uh, if you make a disciple a year for the next 10 years, 30 years, 50 as long as God has you here, and then those people, just a disciple, every, let's say every decade, we're talking hundreds and thousands of people into the future because of the things you do in 2024. Let's be at it. God's a work in us. He's a work through us. We are dead to death and we are light in Christ. Let's shine. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for these scriptures, for these promises, for your, your phenomenal kindness to us in Jesus. Not only have you loved us and saved us and brought us into your family, into your kingdom, <clears throat> not only have you given us a new nature, a new heart, your Holy Spirit living in us, but you invite us to participate in your work in the world. And so, Father, we want to we be about your business. We want to be fruitful. We want to participate in the fruitful deeds of the lion. And so help us to have that zoomed out perspective, to see things how you see them, to seek the wisdom that comes from you. Help us to bring you glory with our lives, with our actions, with our words, with our relationships, with our thoughts, with our worship. Help us to become more like Jesus. Help us to love each other well and encourage one another and spur one another on to love and good works, just like we've spoken about today. Especially as the day draws closer. And Father, if Jesus isn't coming back for a very long time, or if He's coming back tomorrow, Father, when He comes, may we be found about Your business with our robes washed clean shining our light for your